Good morning. And welcome to worship at Bowling Green Presbyterian Church on this 23rd Sunday after uh, Pentecost as well as Veterans Recognition Sunday and the ordination and installation of our new elders. So we're glad to have all of you here. Um, I do have several announcements to make. Um, the first is that we still might need some Thanksgiving drivers. Um, we only need six this year, so if we get six people to sign up, that means we only have two stops that you'd need to make, and the sign-up sheet is on the back table. Um, also, we have a Blues Senior Recital is tomorrow at 7.30 in Barnes Hall at Winthrop. So I think you're going to give us a link to the live if, if we can see it. So if you can't make it there in person, um, be watching your email or Facebook. We'll make sure we have that up for you. Uh, we also have this morning in your bulletin, you should have your happy birthday to Jesus insert. That is this Wednesday, and there's no cost, but we have fun together, do all kinds of Christmas activities, and eat pizza. We love pizza. But the outreach team does need to know for how many people to plan. So if you could, um, let us know. Also, we have the roadside pickup is this coming Saturday at 8 o'clock. And it would really, really be great if we could get some younger folks that are willing to come out and help. So um, please plan to help make this corner of God's world um, a little bit um, more beautiful by clean, helping us clean up our, our roadside. I'm very, very excited today because uh, we have a guest speaker, a veteran, to speak to us today about a powerful experience. My mother, who is here as well, often sends me the links to her worship service, and she'll say, oh, Jeff had such a good sermon. I, I want you to listen to it, and I know his sermons are good. I've heard his sermons. But after writing two or three in my head each week and tweaking the one that's going to be in paper even as late as early Sunday morning, I don't really want to have to watch or listen to another sermon. I'm sermoned out. But something just kept coming to me about, I need to see Mr. Vipperman's story. And so last Sunday, when I watched what he had done at Oakland Baptist, their church, um, my home church, I, I was just amazed by his story. So next thing you know, I'm finding out his information to call him, and he's graciously um, agreed to, to lead our message today. So I know you will all give him a warm welcome. As a daughter of an army, veteran, and as a daughter-in-law of a Navy veteran, it is my pleasure to recognize our veterans today. At the Veterans Day luncheon last Friday, the keynote speaker, the Colonel Buddy Holbrook, gave us some statistics that I did not know, and he said that only 1% of our population, 330 million people, only 1% are active military. And they said, that's, that's a very small percent to keep all the rest of us safe and secure. And then he said, but this might even be more surprising. There's only 2.5% of our population who are veterans. Some of our veterans enlisted, signed up, some were drafted in, but all answered the call when called upon to serve our country. And so I would like at this time to recognize our veterans. So veterans, if you would, please stand. Let us worship the Lord.
The Psalm 98 is a song over God's victory over evil. And all who love the Lord share in this victory. So join with me now using those words as we call ourselves in to worship the Lord. We give thanks to you, God. We give marvelous thanks. Let the waters clap their hands. Let the trees dance. Let the birds sing for joy. May we remember today. Today and every day. That you have done Let us pray. <coughs> Creator God, in your great love, you assure us that you walk with us in Christ Jesus. In this time of worship, we praise you for the hope you offer us in Christ. We trust that you are working in your church and in creation, so all that is broken will be made whole. Through our prayers and our praise, strengthen our trust in your promised future, O God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer. Amen.
and gracious forgiveness. Christ, friends, Christ's love and God's grace covers us. All God asks is that we love the Lord. This love changes us. It defines us. It transforms us. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Hallelujah. Amen. And now remaining right where you are, let us share the peace of Christ with one another by waving to your friends and neighbors. The peace of Christ be with you all. be seated for the children's message and kids I want to invite y'all to come down we have buckets today for you to collect our quarters we've been collecting so many we actually have some buckets for y'all to take come on Sarah John hey Preston you want to get a bucket for your quarters you already have well good get your quarters Reese you want to get it for your quarters uh oh I'm sorry well, I can't pick that up. Does anybody else need a bucket? You need a bucket too? Great. Right. For those of you who are visiting with us, we collect rustling bags of, for food for the hungry and non-perishable goods to go to Clover School District's uh, pantry. And then we collect quarters for Heifer International so that we can buy animals for, to help people all around the world. You want to go sit down? You want to go sit down? Oh, I put that one. Thank you, Lola. Okay. Good morning, guys. Good morning. Okay, I brought some pictures. family. Okay, do y'all know who these people might be? Those are my grandparents. That, that is me. Those are my grandparents. I am in the middle. And then, mm-hmm. Then who is this? That's not my cousin. That is my brother. Okay, now what about, he does not play football. <laughs> And then, last picture, who do y'all think these people are? Your family. Yes, these are. <laughs> yeah, these.
These are all my very, very best friends. So, okay, so, mm -hmm. so all of these people, do you think it's easy for me to show love to all of these people? No? You don't think it's easy for me to show love to all these people? Okay, it is pretty easy. These are all my family and friends, right? Okay, so what about people that I'm not super close with? Do you think it's easy for me to show love to them? It's harder, isn't it? Right? Exactly, John. So if I'm so So, um, what John said was that it was easy to show love to these people because we're friends with them, but God calls us to show love to everyone. And that's exactly what we're talking about today, is when Jesus had his sermon on the mount, he told us that even though we're called to love our friends and our neighbors, we're also called to love our enemies and the people that we don't always get along with and we maybe don't want to share lunch with at school, but we're still called to love them and show them God's love, right? Exactly. We should share God's love to other people. So can y'all make an agreement that we're going to all start showing love to everyone? Yes. <laughs> okay, can y'all pray with me this morning? Okay. Good morning, Lord. It's us again. Thank you for teaching us to love others, even if they don't always love us. Amen. Let us pray. Holy God, you speak words of challenge and words of comfort through the scriptures. Send your spirit to open our understanding to the word we need to hear this day for the sake of Jesus Christ, your living word. Amen. In the fifth chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus teaches his disciples to live and act differently. This passage is also known as the you have heard it said, but I say to you passage, where Jesus is saying to the followers, forget what you've taught been taught, listen to the teacher, capital T. He begins with a lot of things about our keeping our vows and adultery and divorce and those things, but then he kind of ends this chapter on the hardest one that he expects us to follow, and that is Matthew 5, verses 43 through 48. Jesus said, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do this? And if you salute only your brethren, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You, therefore, must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Good morning to all. It's wonderful being in your church. Um, I'm David Vipperman. My wife, Clue, is sitting with us over here with Caroline Kruger and Robert and, and your pastor, Lisa. Uh, I feel so honored being here um, for you to invite me to worship with you today uh, is very meaningful to me, and I'm honored by that, and I'm especially honored not only to be invited to worship with you, but it's uh, to stand in this pulpit. That's a great honor. And for you, Lisa, to offer that, thank you for that. A little, uh, little background. Uh, I grew up in Rock Hill, went to school there, uh, left and uh, went to the Citadel, graduated from the Citadel. But before I went to the Citadel, I met uh, someone who was to become a general, my wife, Clue. Uh, <laughs> Clue was, is from Lake City, uh, South Carolina. Some of you may know where that is, but it's in Florence County, a little farm community, maybe 5,000 people. But we met at the beach. And with me, it was love at first sight, not with her. It took a little work on my part over years. But Clue went to Winthrop uh, University. I went to the Citadel. And uh, four years later, we both graduated within a couple of weeks of each other. And then a few weeks after that, we were married. So we have been together a long time, over 60 years. Another thing, uh, just as a matter of background so you'll know who's speaking to you, when I went to the Citadel, uh, I was offered a commission in the Air Force. Uh, I was also offered a place at pilot training when I graduated. That was perfect for me because I had fallen in love with airplanes like a lot of little boys do and now a lot of Young ladies fall in love with it, and we have combat male and female pilots. And I was just, it was a wonderful time in life to meet the love of my life and to be offered a commission in the Air Force and then allowed to fly for the Air Force. So after we married, um, I went to pilot training, and that was a little over a year. Then I was offered a very unusual assignment and one that I just could hardly believe. There was a new airplane that was being manufactured, and this isn't terribly important to you, but it's known as the F-4 Phantom. It was the fastest airplane, fighter airplane in the world. Uh, many times I could exceed 1,500 miles an hour. It was fast. And for a young man to put, you know, to strap that airplane on, we say, as we get in the cockpit, and they let you fly it. it. It was just an amazing time in life to have that opportunity as a young man. Very exciting. Because I flew that airplane, the first mission I had was to go to Okinawa in the far western Pacific and provide air defense from any Chinese or Russian airplanes that may uh, come into our airspace. That went on for almost a year. We were separated for six months. As soon as I got back home, the next thing I had to look forward to was going to Southeast Asia, to Thailand, to be a part of the Vietnam War. Now, you take a young man who is early 20s, mid 20s at the latest, married to a beautiful woman, paid given an airplane that was that fast and that powerful, uh, it was an exciting time in life. And so uh, I went to Thailand. I flew 100 missions over North Vietnam. And then I flew 19 more missions over Laos. It was just as dangerous because we had to circumnavigate, not circumnavigate, but fly over Laos to get to Vietnam but we were always at 20, 30,000 feet, stay out of the, the AAA anti-aircraft artillery. 
But then when you get down low, they had a lot of guns that they trained on. So it was all part of that. But as a young man, it, you, I always say fighter pilots walk with a swagger. They think they're it, you know. That's, uh, and I, I guess I fell into that too. I was just grateful to be flying that wonderful airplane. And when I got in the cockpit, I felt very much at home. It was a very secure place for me. Now, that's, that's a little bit of my background. In those missions that I flew, I, um, we, I should say, uh, we dropped a lot of bombs. We, we fired a lot of rockets all over that country. We had a lot of, there were a lot of threats to us Anti-aircraft artillery was very tough. The SAM missiles, surface-to-air missiles, shot down some of my best friends. One of them I watched go down. Uh, it, it was a, a, a dangerous environment to fly over. But as young men, and being called to duty by your country for the purpose of the war, uh, you, there was a great willingness there. And we even found in those days that if there was a special dangerous mission and they looked for volunteers, almost everybody in the room would raise their hand. I'll do it. They were, they were motivated. So that's, that's background. Let's fast forward to three or four years ago, I received a telephone call from a former pilot, lives in Iowa, practicing law, and he said, how would you like to go to Hanoi? I said, well, what, what's up? He said, there's some of us who are, want to return to Hanoi. We want to meet with former fighter pilots that we flew against, and I said, well, what is the mission? And he said, basically, he said it in his own words, but it was be becoming friendly and reconciliation. I said, who's sponsoring this? He said, no one. This is all out of our pocket. The, United the government is not sponsoring it here. The government in North Vietnam is not sponsoring it there. The Air Force is not involved. This is a matter of a few pilots who are willing to dig deep into their pockets and go to Hanoi to find their pilots, as many as we can, um, and to get together to be friendly and see where it leads. The Another individual who was working with this had been a Marine Corps pilot who was now one of Delta Airlines' chief captains. He had, he had become friends with a Vietnamese general because, well, I, won't go, I should not go into that detail, it's too long, but he had become friends with a former general who had been a pilot who had flown against us and he, they, they got along so well in their communication that they said, if we can do this, let's expand the group and find a group of fighter pilots on both sides uh, to gather, to meet, to make friends, and see what happens. And I was excited about going there. There were 15 American pilots, all old fighter pilots, who agreed to dig into their pockets and make this trip happen. When we got there, we gathered quickly with 23 of their pilots that we had fought against. We, in a room, just getting acquainted, was sitting at a table, sharing, and some of, some of them could speak pretty good English. We could speak none. We had interpreters with us. And after being there a while and sort of generally getting acquainted, 
The person sitting across the table from me, I noticed he'd been sizing me up. He kept looking at me and changing his head. And when we took a break, he walked around the table, stuck out his hand, and he said um, to me, he said, you flew that Phantom. I said, yes, what did you fly? He said, I flew the MiG-21. Now, you all may not know what that is, probably don't. That was Russia's top fighter that they were flying. And he said, you dropped bombs on our country, in our city. Yes. You fired many rockets at us. I said, that's right. I didn't know where he was leading, but I was prepared for it not to be a good conversation. And then he kind of looked at me like this, and he said, to me, you just look like an old, kind man. <laughs> he really did, and, and immediately, the pressure I was feeling, having to s tell him the truth, that I dropped a lot of bombs on his country, um, I knew there, were, there was going to be a friendship. And he said, I said, his name was Key, Win Key. And Key, I said, Key, do we need to talk about forgiveness here? He said, no. We talk about reconciliation. He was leading me. Reconciliation, uh, making things right. He, and here's what he said to me. He said, you know, uh, and he, he, spoke, he spoke very good English. He had flown for their airline after the war, and everybody who flies airlines around the world has to speak English. You may not know that, but the Russians and everybody else, if you fly in international airspace, you've got to speak English. His English was pretty good. And he said, you know, did you hate me? I said, Key, I didn't know you. He said, you didn't hate me. I was just a machine you were trying to shoot down. I didn't hate you. I didn't know you. So why do we have to forgive? Uh, let's reconcile. We are on different sides, sides of this issue. And he said, we, let's reconcile and make things right. And then he said this, I would like to be your brother. I was stunned. And we shook hands, we embraced, and I said, I accept you as your American brother. Interesting. Now, he said, I want to introduce you to someone. Took me across the room. Some of you may not remember this, but the ruler of their country at that time was Ho Chi Minh. Ho Chi Minh, the pictures that were often run of him, he had a long beard, um, dressed in a black suit, and he said, we're gonna meet Van Bai, right over there. Van Bai looked like Ho Chi Minh. He was a little older than we, three or four years older than I am. Uh, he, what I learned quickly, Van Bai was their national hero. Van Bai had shot down more Americans than anybody else. He was good and he had a reputation. If you ever see somebody that makes the right moves in the air, and he said, it may be Van Bai, be careful, he'll get you and he did get a number of Americans. And I didn't know how I would feel about that, um, but I was willing to meet him. Uh, he smiled a lot, and when he was in, we were introduced, he spoke no English. Of course, I spoke no Vietnamese, but we had an interpreter. And he kept he was talking constantly, and then when he would talk, a while, he would punch me in the side with his elbow. And I asked the interpreter, I said, what does that mean? He says, well, he's telling jokes, he wants you to laugh. <laughs> now, can you imagine you go from a combatant, an enemy, someone you're trying to shoot out of the sky, he's trying to shoot us out of the sky, and now he wants to be friends. And then Van Bai, 
he, he said through his interpreter, I want you to come to my farm for lunch tomorrow. I said, Van Bye, where do you live? Where's the farm? 750 miles from here. How are we going to get there? Don't worry. Meet me at the airport. And I was not the only one. There were several of us that he invited, a handful. And we met at the airport, and I'm shortening the story, of course, a little bit. He, um, we just walked on board the airplane. Didn't pay anything. He didn't pay anything. But when we were climbing the stairs to ride this uh, Vietnamese airline down to Ho Chi Minh City, which is old Saigon, people would do that as he came by, national hero. So we went to his farm, but when we landed in Saigon, or now Ho Chi Minh City, he said, let's, through his interpreter, let's go to the opera. I said, isn't this interesting? From fighter pilots doing war, and now he, before we go to his farm for lunch, we want to go to the opera. So, same thing, no tickets or anything. We walk in, they all bow to him, took us to the front row, and you could feel, it's, it's something is hard to describe really, but there's a chemistry that happens. We couldn't communicate very well. We did it through an interpreter. That's not always totally satisfactory. Uh, but we went to the opera, sat on the front row, had a wonderful time, went to his farm, had a wonderful lunch, and fellowship there, and uh, it, it was just an unreal experience. You can't plan that. You have to go with, a, in our case, tried to go with a right attitude, a right spirit, and it was one that we kept in mind, reconciliation. And these guys didn't talk about love this and love that because of the background, but that's what, that's what was motivating this, is the desire to meet, to reconcile, and, and to, also we were interested, how has this changed our lives? And this thing was working, and, and we didn't have a firm agenda. It was just get together, be friendly, and see what happens. And things began to happen. Two things now I would like. I want to fast forward from Vietnam War years. Um, I don't think Clue will mind uh, if I say this, but uh, Clue's had a, an experience with cancer, and she's doing well and got good reports. I, I communicated that to win. Key, my friend who wanted to be an American brother. I sent him an email, told him what was happening in Clue and how she was progressing. He wrote her back the most beautiful letter. Wishing, and he lives in a socialist, communist country. Wishing her, praying for that God would heal her and heal her quickly. Mm. And I think about him coming around that table way back for you know, several years, and now here's this former fighter pilot we flew against, and he got shot down, by the way, by us. Broke his arms when he ejected out of the airplane. His arms healed, he came back into the battle, so he was a fierce fighter. But now he's writing Clue a letter praying for God's healing. Beautiful in our lives. Now, not too long, after that trip to Hanoi and coming back, about a year, I got 1.30 in the morning, the phone rang. When the phone rings at 1.30 in the morning, what do you think? Either wrong number or no good news. We answered, Clue answered the phone. Couldn't understand him. It was Van Bai, the guy had shot down so many of our planes. It was his son, couldn't speak 
good English at all. B very broken English. So I got on the line and I could understand enough. And why he called us was he said, my father, Van By, was working in his garden, had a stroke. He's dying. He wanted me to call you. That's a life changer. When a former enemy uh, uh, forming life changing experiences, wonderful. I began to um, know that even after a war like that, which was a horrible war, reconciliation can take place. Forgiveness comes, but the way, again, they explained it to me, we didn't hate you as a person. We're protecting our country. You didn't hate us as individuals. Your country called you to duty. What, one other thing that I thought was interesting. One of the Vietnamese that helped put this together had retired as a general. Handsome man. I saw him. He looked like a movie star. He was putting this together and there was communication back and forth before we went over there. And he wrote us one day and said his wife had died. This was about 10 days before we were scheduled to go over there. And, we, and his name was General Swat. And, and we ex said basically as a group, General, you know, you don't have to join us. You've got all, he said, no, I'm gonna be there. It's, it's important to me to be a part of this. So it's not something that, uh, I don't know how to say this, maybe without being misunderstood, but this didn't start in, in a church, an organization. It was people who were willing to reconcile things. And you know what else this reminded me of, and I, sometimes I, I can't uh, remember the name, but the, um, the church in Charleston, Emmanuel Methodist Episcopal Church. You, do you all remember what happened there a few, five, six years ago when somebody walked in the church and shot, killed, a, 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 I don't know how long, half a dozen of their members while they were there for prayer meeting. Um, and do, do you all remember what that church did? They forgave him. They, uh, and it makes you think that some of the, I'll call them somewhat petty differences that divide us, that cause difficulties in fellowships and in relationships and friendships sometimes. Uh, but when you, when you see these things happen, it, it just changes your life. I would like to mention one other thing, and I'm probably, when I get, thank you for listening. Uh, you know, we all have a story and we need ears to hear it, and you all have graciously provided ears to hear my story. I, I think it's maybe this, do you remember uh, we're all too young for this, we were children, but Pearl Harbor, when the Japanese attacked, and you've probably heard or seen, you, maybe you've seen the movie, Tora, 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 which means we've accomplished surprise. Um, I think it's important to hear this because you don't hear these stories very much. The Japanese Mitsuo Fuchida, who planned that air attack on Pearl Harbor, where we had lost almost 3,000 men, women. He, led, he planned the attack, he led the attack, he hated Americans. 
he, he said later, I didn't just fight because I was in, in, in the uh, Japanese Air Force. I hated Americans. But when the war was over and he realized that they had treated us inhumanely, our, the, those prisoners that he ca they had captured, we treated their, the prisoners we had, the Japanese prisoners in our camp, we treated basically hum humanely. Now I know there are some where people did not do that, but generally. And Fachida, Mitsu Fachida, after the war tried to figure that out. Why were they kind to us, treated us okay, and we treated them inhumanely, and he, he was directed to the values that come out of the scripture. Most people don't know this, but I invite you to get on your phones when you get home and you can quickly learn this. He, when he found out what, where our values are through our spiritual life, through the word of God, he became a Christian. Not only that, he went to seminary. Not only that, he formed an evangelistic association and preached all over America and all over Japan until he died in 1976. And so in, in these horrible times and where relationships are breached and, and because of the leadership leading us into um, combat, leading us into uh, denying others their rights, um, there, there are these stories that come out of that where reconciliation can, to, and if it can take place uh, between combatants who fought against each other, tried to kill each other, had all these differences, and people like Fachita who hated us, uh, and how life, life can change. Uh, and, and of course, Christ provides the pattern for that. And gratefully, gladly, he provides not only the pattern, but the power, the ability to do that. And I, I think of Kui again, my friend who came over and, and wanted to make friends with me. I didn't take, I wish I could say I took the initiative. I can't say that. Let's all, we hope, and I'm speaking about all that can have an attitude of finding ways to reconciliation. And if it doesn't lead to any place, but we learn to live in peace, to me, is, is the great lesson here. It can change attitudes. Hostilities cease. And we're not, I'm not now talking about worldly with, with what's going on in, in Russia and other places in China and the world. I'm, I'm talking about the, this, the spirit that I saw among these combatants. Uh, can happen in places like Rock Hill and Oakland Baptist Church and other places in life where that's needed and, uh, and, or will be needed at, at, at some time. Thank you for allowing me to express, not in being very articulate, but to be able to share something that's changed my life. When two former enemies can embrace each other as brothers, we can indeed agree that it wasn't their human ability to do that, but rather it was indeed the Spirit of God between them, moving them to that reconciliation. And Jesus Christ was indeed the example that they, can use, they used then and we can use today. So thank you so much, Mr. Vipperman. If there are those of you who need to do a little bit of work on reconciliation in your own lives, because as we know, Jesus Christ says, you, my disciples will be known by their love. 
And if you don't know how to make that first step, I'd invite you to meet with me or one of our elders so that we can get you on that process of reconciliation. Let us now stand and affirm our faith together using the words of we believe that is printed in your bulletin. Please stand. Faith necessitates a choice, and by the grace of Christ, we can choose. And so, Almighty God, we choose to believe that your light is better than darkness, sharing is better than hoarding, your truth is better than deceit, your mercy is better than revenge, your love is better than indifference, to dream with you is better than to fear. And that you, O oh God, are stronger than chaos. We choose to believe in your abilities over our own and lean on your understanding on the long and narrow road of life. By grace, we choose to have faith and we worship in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I do have our joys and concerns to share with you uh, today. First, uh, Grant had a, a pediatric rheumatology appointment last week, and they're changing his medication. The one he had before was making him sick, so we're praying that this new medication will, uh, will not have many side effects, but he doesn't seem to let anything past him, so, but we will pray for him. Um, also, Ashley uh, Petty Schrader was given a diagnosis this past week from the Mayo Clinic, and it's a genetic disorder that she will live with, um, but her spirits are, are very high, so we'll continue to pray for her. Max Russell is having shoulder surgery on December 6th. He's uh, 
the way he describes it, it sounds terrible, but it's like he's got nothing left of tendons or ligaments in his shoulder. But when the surgeon called him himself and said, you need to have this surgery next week, he says, well, I'm a landscaper. I've got to do it after leaves. <laughs> so, um, so he will be December, but keep him in our prayers. And even though Dave Woods is doing better this week after recovering from pneumonia, his brother Dale had spinal surgery this past week, and um, it ended up being like a 12-hour surgery, and he's in a lot of pain, so I want to pray for him. As well as Joel's mother, Beth Jones, who uh, started chemotherapy this past week, so I want to um, pray for her as well. And then on to our celebrations. Our big celebration is that here in the United States of America, we do live as free people. And that is indeed thanks to all of our veterans who answered that call to serve. So once again, we want to lift up all veterans who answered that call. Also, thanks to both David and Clue for being here with us today, and Mom. <laughs> um, Joanne is going to be a great grandmother. Uh, Haley is expecting a baby in April, so we want to celebrate with her. And then Max Russell's birthday is this week. So unite your hearts with mine as we do indeed go to the Lord in prayer. Oh God, we wait for you to come again into our midst. Sometimes we wait patiently, sometimes not. Always we are aware of how much this world needs you. We pray today for those in our world who need your healing and comfort. We ask that you give them your comfort as you surround them with your presence. Asking for your healing mercy, we lift up our concerns silently to you. Father God, we also have calls for joy. With grateful hearts, we now lift up our celebrations. Oh Lord, we pray for persons in leadership across our country that together they might make wise decisions on our behalf. We pray for our brothers and sisters around the world whose lives are torn apart by war, poverty, oppression, and hopelessness. Oh God, we pray for our veterans who gave and continue to give their best when called upon to protect and serve. Grant them your peace and give them our thanks for the freedoms they have preserved, our future they have defended, and the ideals they have embodied. Remind us of their sacrifices so that we do not so easily take our freedoms for granted. Oh God, expand our grateful hearts to love others, those in yesteryears or yesterday, that we would call enemies before we can now call our brothers and sisters in Christ. Inspire us by your desire to reconcile with humanity at such a heavy cost. Remind us of your never-ending and perfect love that you poured upon us in the life, death, and resurrection of your Son. Embolden us to reconcile with our enemies by allowing your perfect love to transform them into our friends. God of gracious generosity, we bring your tithes and our gifts with grateful hearts, aware of all that we enjoy in Christ and in creation. Bless these gifts and the service we offer in Jesus' name so that others may share in your goodness and know of the love we have witnessed in Christ, our friend and Savior. We pray, knowing that you are with us now and that you will strengthen us to keep awake, to keep the faith, to keep working for the time when Christ will come again, to surprise us anew with love and justice on earth. And it is in your Son's name that we pray together say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, 
as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We will now move into our service of ordination and installation of our newly elected elders. We are called into the Church of Jesus Christ by baptism and marked as Christ owned by the Holy Spirit. This is our common calling to be disciples and servants of our servant Lord. Within the community of the church, some are called to particular service as deacons, as elders, as commissioned pastors, and as ministers of the word and sacrament. Ordination is Christ's gift to the church, assuring that his ministry continues among us, providing for ministries of caring and compassion in the world, ordering the governance of the church, and preaching the word, and administering the sacraments. Forward. Chris, Susan, and Joel will be ordained as ruling elders, and all four of them will be installed as ruling elders. To all of you, do you trust in Jesus Christ, your Savior? Acknowledge him Lord of all and head of the church, and, all the, and through him believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Do you accept the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be by the Holy Spirit the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ in the church universal and God's word to you? I do. Will you fulfill your ministry and obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of the scripture and be continually guided by your confessions? Will you be governed by our church's polity and will you abide by its discipline? Will you be a friend among your colleagues in ministry, working with them, subject to the ordering of God's word and spirit? Will you in your own life seek to follow the Lord Christ Jesus, love your neighbors, and work for the reconciliation of the world? Do you promise to further the peace, unity, and purity of the church? Will you pray for and seek to serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love. Will you be a faithful elder, watching over the people, providing for their worship, nurture, and service? Will you share in the government and discipline, serving in governing bodies of the church, and in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? Now, these questions are for the congregation. We're asking that you promise to support these officers. Do we, the members of the church, accept these persons as elders chosen by God through the voice of this congregation to lead us in the way of Jesus Christ? If so, please say, we do. We do. Do we agree to encourage them to respect their decisions and to follow as they guide us, serving Jesus Christ, who alone is the head of the church? If so, please say, we do. We all have the joy of using our gifts as members of the church at different times and in different ways 
Today we have the joy of ordaining first-time elders as they seek to answer the call of Christ. So this is to Chris, Susan, and Joel. We give thanks to God that you have responded to Christ's invitation to lead, care, and support the flock of God's people here at Bowling Green Presbyterian Church. Ordination is a blessing, but it is not a call of convenience, a call of comfort, or a call of carelessness. Being lifted by God to this leadership role and affirmed by both the congregation and the session of this church, you are taking on a responsibility of your time, your patience, your creativity, and your energy. But with God's help, guidance, and grace, your leadership will be fruitful, fearless, and faithful. It is the tradition of this church and our denomination to ask the three of you now to kneel so that all those in our congregation who enjoy the blessing of ordination can come and lay hands on you so that you will know that the foundation here has been secured. The cornerstone is our Lord Jesus Christ, and your task is the continual blessing and building of Christ's church here in the world. So please kneel. I invite now all of those who are, enjoy the ordination of being an elder or a deacon to come forward, laying their hands on Chris, Susan, and Joel as a sign of our blessing. Let us pray. Almighty God, today we are grateful that you've called Johnny, Chris, Susan, and Joel to serve you and your church as elders. We ask your blessings on their ministries for creativity and ideas, for patience during trials, for love at all times. God, we ask you to help each and every one of us to support our church leaders in your ministry here in word, in deed, and in prayer. Lord, you have called each one of us by name. Bless our work in all that we do to further your kingdom on earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Chris, Susan, and Joel, you are now ordained, installed, and active elders in the Presbyterian Church USA for this congregation. And Johnny, you are now a renewed active elder for this congregation. And to all of you and to all of us, whatever we do in word and deed, do everything in the name of Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Amen. This now concludes our service of ordination and installation. We will now be singing Standing on the Promises on page 838 in your hymn book. Y'all can say it. <laughs> Yeah. 
of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. And as you go, remember, in the goodness of God, you are brought into this world. And by the grace of God, you've been sustained, even to this very moment. And by the love of God, fully revealed in the life of Jesus Christ, you are being redeemed. Amen.